take a much more structured approach uh, and a transparent approach really to incorporating patient and caregiver views into such assessments. And this is, of course, what birthed um, uh, the PFDD program out of the FDA. And you can t go to the next slide. So uh, when FIDASIA passed, uh, PPMD spared really no time uh, beginning to look at innovative ways uh, of, of collecting data, engaging the FDA and drug companies uh, about our community, really to um, like inform the work they're doing uh, on behalf of patients. And, and I think over time, we've really invested in developing a series of tools um, for anybody uh, in our drug development ecosystem uh, so that they were more aware of how patients and caregivers think and feel about a range of topics. Um, and we, we've developed white papers, wrote uh, a draft guidance for the FDA, evolved our patient reported registry, um, held meetings with the FDA over time, in public forums, and uh, uh, recently even modeled um, uh, an externally led uh, PFDD meeting uh, that Andy Kennedy was a part of with I um, called the Patient Focus Impact um, uh, Compass Meeting. And, um, and, and then finally, we've, in an effort to quantify the patient voice, we've conducted really a series of these patient preference studies, collecting data on how patients and caregivers view things like benefits and risks uh, and uncertainty for emerging therapies, ultimately quantifying that patient voice and providing data. And while we were developing these tools, many other groups in our space were doing the same thing, um, collecting patient-specific information to inform their own drug development ecosystems. So you can uh, move on to the next slide. And soon, um, we also, a new legislative vehicle present itself, uh, an opportunity to further that work um, with PFDD, the work done since FIDASIA, and that bill, of course, was the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, and, and we, along with many in the rare disease community, um, including Every Life uh, and, and RDLA, uh, helped organize uh, listening sessions with Congress, participated in congressional hearings, worked with our members on specific provisions, and what you see on the screen here, um, many of which made it into the final legislation, uh, and, and one of which was the Patient Focus Impact Assessment Act, or PFIA, which was one such legislative idea that PPMD led during CURE's discussions and, and did make it into the final bill, and you can go to the next slide. The bill really was focused on transparency out of the FDA, requiring them to develop a tool, um, sort of like a checklist of how product reviewers were or were not using PFDD data uh, and information uh, that uh, PPMD and other rare communities had been leading the development of since PDUFA 5 FIDASIA, um, and really to serve as this feedback loop so we can understand if the investments we were making at the end of the day were they actually making to the people that mattered at the end of the review process. Um, it also did require FDA to do a series of guidance documents regarding collection of patient experience data. Um, this, was, uh, this bill, S-1597, was sponsored by Wicker and Klobuchar and um, had the support of well over 50 stakeholder groups, including Levy Life um, Foundation and, and, and many others in our community, our rare disease community, so you can go to the next stage. It's always important to take a look at the pathway of, of, of how this ended up being implemented. Um, and, and here's the path this took. It was introduced in June 2015. We actually held our annual conference in D.C. this year, which was a great timing. Um, uh, Annie and I actually organized a huge rally around the CURES legislation in general, but uh, including the provisions we were supporting, but in, uh, we were focused on PFIA. So uh, we went to our members uh, and, and advocated for uh, this bill. And the, the bill passed the Senate, here you see in, in 2016. Um, and then uh, thanks to our champions and coordinated advocacy and a lot of work, we were thrilled to see it in the final cures legislation uh, that our language was included, section 3001, in reference to patient experience data. And then in 2018, we saw the actual implementation take place in, um, uh, with the approval of, of Genentech's hem lever drug, um, we were able to see this actual checklist, and I included that on the screen here of the statement of patient experience 
it's always nice to, to see the final product and how this, this was actually implemented at the end of the day. Um, we now have uh, more transparency and clarity around whether this data makes it to the appropriate decision makers. But with that, questions still remain around how it's incorporated into the decision making. So that gap still exists. And you can go to the next slide. To fill that gap, we need a logical next step, in our view, is to pass this uh, Benefit Act. Um, here you see on the screen a little bit more on that. It's, this legislation will ensure that that patient experience data that I've been talking about, PFDD-related data, um, including data developed not only by product sponsor but third parties such as patient advocacy organizations and academic institutions who are um, investing more and more in this type of work, that it be considered as part of that benefit risk assessment, that signature tool uh, that is used at FDA for evaluating benefit risk um, for products. So we, we feel this action will, um, it, it will, it will send an important signal to all stakeholders that patient experience and PFDD data are fully incorporated into that review process. And I think many of us think it will encourage other entities to develop this scientifically rigorous, meaningful uh, data for um, uh, FDA, not only FDA, but we feel this data um, has value across the drug development ecosystem. So the bill was passed um, uh, by the Senate in 2017, but it was not introduced in the House. Um, so next slide. I think it's important just to see how it looks in practice. Here you have the current matrix on the left side, the signature tool out of the FDA showing um, how it is today. On the right, you see where the section would need to be added. So uh, it feels like a natural evolution for us of where we've gone with PFDD. Reviewers would not only have to tell us they had access to the data, but now uh, they'd be communicating how the data may or may not be factored into that uh, decision making and be a bit more transparent uh, to how they're using it. Um, so uh, with the incorporation of this section, we feel Congress will help further embed that patient voice into this FDA review process. Um, so that's uh, last slide. This is my final slide just to say this is where we are. We're working with our Senate champions to reintroduce introduce the bill this year and starting conversations with our House sponsors uh, on a companion piece. Um, so uh, we'll be uh, on the Hill uh, in March. Um, I'll also be at the, uh, the Every Life meeting. Uh, hopefully see, see many of you there. Um, but our March advocacy conference is uh, the 8th through the 10th, and we have around 150 advocates coming, and this will be one of the pieces they're talking about. <clears throat> so did I do it in 10 minutes, or did I go over? <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, Ryan. And if anyone has questions um, for Ryan, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them for you. Um, if you don't have Ryan's contact information, of course, you can email myself and I can connect to you. Does the Benefit Act have a bill number yet? Uh, it does not. Ryan, it does not yet have it has not a number. Been yet. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All righty. I'm going to pass it on over to Riley. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kylie Barber. I am the Medical Food Policy Fellow um, with the National PKU Alliance in partnership with the Every Life Foundation. And I'm here to talk about the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. All right, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Medical Nutrition Equity Act, um, each year, thousands of children and adults in the United States are diagnosed with certain digestive or inborn errors of metabolism that prevent their bodies from digesting and metabolizing the foods that they eat. For them, um, medically necessary food is the standard care of treatment. And the purpose of the Medical Nutrition Equity Act is to provide for the coverage of medical, medically necessary food and vitamins in individual amino acids for <clears throat> digestive and inherited metabolic disorders um, under both federal as well as private health insurance programs. Okay, and so the bill covers 31 um, specific conditions and as far as um, the products that are covered, there are several parts. So specifically for PKU, they require a medical formula that looks similar to what you see or what you might see an infant take, um, although it has all the 
components that an infant needs to grow and develop normally it just doesn't have the ascending amino acid that impacts their digestion and um, uh, metabolism. And then the second part are what's called medical foods, and they are mainly breads and pastas, um, sort of energy bars that supplement their diet because they can't just survive on just medical formula alone. They won't get the caloric intake. Um, and so those are all included under medically necessary foods and um, what we're trying to get covered. Okay, so the current status in the legislative process has been introduced in the House. Uh, the bill number is HR 2501, and it was introduced by Representatives McGovern and Jamie Herrera Butler on May 2nd, and it has been referred to committees. Um, Energy and Commerce, Ways and Means, Armed Services, and Oversight and Reform. And we currently have 52 co-sponsors. We have four new co-sponsors sign on within the last month or so. I'm um, really excited about 52 co-sponsors. It's the most co-sponsors, um, the most legislative support we've seen in the history of this bill. And on the Senate side, we are um, at a bit of a standstill. Senator Casey is anxiously awaiting to reintroduce it, but we are trying to find a Republican co-sponsor to lead it as well. Um, we were previously considering Senator Scott, but he is no longer um, interested in, in uh, co-sponsoring, being a lead co-sponsor, so we've, we're moving on. We're considering Senator Daines from Montana, Senator Cassidy uh, from Louisiana, Lankford from Oklahoma, as well as Ernst from Iowa. Um, and as far as the reaching out efforts, we have a cost study that we actually have the results out and we're waiting to do a briefing over it. So after we do a briefing in the end of January, that's when we'll continue to do a push. We'll ask organizations to send co-sponsor ask letters to the senators, as well as getting, you know, rallying the advocates in these specific states to reach out um, to these members. Um, and we. We'll go over the cost study at the Patients and Providers for Medical Nutrition Equity Coalition in-person meeting on January 31st. <laughs> but what advocates can do right now is continue to submit their patient stories on the coalition website, which is nutritionequity.org. And we have a lot of representation for PKU patients. We are looking for representation of the other conditions. Um, just to have a good, diverse patient population on there. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My email is kbarber at theeverylifefoundation.org. That's it. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, so hi, my name's uh, Dylan Simon. I'm the uh, Newborn Screening Policy Fellow with the Every Life Foundation. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about the updates surrounding Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act. Uh, so just a little bit of background on newborn screening, just to reorient ourselves. Uh, newborn screening is one of the more successful public health programs in the country in the sense that it provides the opportunity to diagnose uh, a, hands, a collection of diseases when they're asymptomatic and you can really make a, make a difference in the child's life. Uh, a lot of these diseases, uh, even as the new therapies are being developed, uh, they cannot repair degradation that has already happened. And so getting treatments to these kids as early as possible prevents the degradation from happening and can help prevent intellectual and physical disabilities uh, from developing, as well as a lot of these diseases are life-threatening. Um, in addition, it also saves costs. Uh, as we all know, healthcare costs is a big deal. And to get these treatments in earlier saves overall costs in the long run. So just a little bit of background on kind of the federal government's role in this. Uh, there is what's known as the RUSP, or the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, uh, which is a list of disorders recommended by the Secretary of HHS of diseases that should be on these state newborn screening panels. Uh, disorders that are added to the RUSP are, have to be nominated, then go through a nine-month review process uh, to determine the potential net benefit of the screening. Um, there are currently 35 core conditions on the RUSP, uh, and one very key part that needs to be stressed every time is that this is a recommended panel. Uh, the federal government cannot control what the states do in this situation. It is a recommendation to the states 
on what they should screen for, where the states have the final say in what they screen for, what they have on their newborn screening panels. And so a little bit of background on the policy side. Um, this, the original process to get the federal government more involved in newborn screening started in the early 2000s, culminating in 2008 with the passing of the original Newborn Screening Save Lives Act, uh, which established some more guidelines, as well as started to form the advisory committee and, and the RUSP. Uh, and this, you could really see the, the effect of this. In the fact that in 2007, only 10 states screened for the recommended uh, disorders, where currently all 50 states are screening for at least 31 treatable conditions, uh, and that number is continually rising uh, for the amount of states that are treating, covering all 35 other RUSP conditions. So a little bit about the current bill and some key bill provisions. Uh, it reauthorizes, reauthorizes HRSA grants uh, for the states that help to expand the screening program, uh, education materials, as well as help to improve follow-up care. Uh, in addition, it would reauthorize the advisory committee. Uh, the advisory committee is a committee that, as stated before, oversees these RUSP nomination packages and, and makes a recommendation to the secretary on what they believe should be added to the RUSP. Uh, in addition, it would direct the National Academy of Medicine to conduct a study on how to modernize newborn screening. Uh, it's always great to work on the issues of today while looking forward and see how we can continue to improve in the area. And as most reauthorization bills, there's also some language to help to increase authorized funding levels within these programs. So just a little bit of a timeline on the movement of this bill. Uh, Representative Warba Allard and Mike Simpson introduced a bill in May. Uh, we were actually able to hold a hearing on it, and we saw passage of this bill through the House uh, in July. We then saw a Senate companion bill also introduced in July, and that is generally where the bill stands in the House, uh, or in the Senate, so it's passed the House and is kind of sitting in the Senate at the moment. And because of that, next slide, please. Uh, the authorization for these federal programs um, ran out as of September 30th, 2019, so we're still waiting for reauthorization for all these programs. So just a, more, a little more legislative updates. Um, in the FY 2020 budget, there was language put in to support uh, some of these programs. Uh, the CDC's uh, Newborn Screening Quality Assurance Program saw an increase from last year's budget, as well as HRSA's, uh, disease, Harold, sorry, the HRSA's program also saw a $1.5 million increase um, so, which is always good uh, in the fact that the appropriators are still supporting this bill. Uh, but the issue, as you can see in the second point, is that the advisory committee still remains closed. So while the appropriators, since these programs are in discretionary funding, can still fund the programs, uh, aspects of the bill, such as the advisory committee, still remains closed because of the lack of reauthorization. And because of that, um, Diseases at this point cannot be nominated or added to the rust. So, so there are there are families across this country whose lives are being changed because we cannot add diseases to the rust currently, which delays how long it takes for the newborn for these states to start screening for these diseases, which delays how early we can start getting these diagnoses for these families. Uh, every life signed on to a letter to Secretary Azar urging him to use his authority to extend the charter to renew uh, the the authority for the committee. This is a stopgap measure to try to um, remedy the problem I just talked about, but it is not a long-term solution. We do not generally want to see Secretary Azar having to step in and force this issue to happen. We want to see the reauthorization to happen. Um, and there are multiple health programs that will need to be reauthorized at the end of May, uh, which is a potential avenue for newborn screening programs. This all gets to what is going on in the Senate. Um, so in the Senate, Senator Rand Paul has introduced an amendment that will require informed consent for the dry blood spots associated with newborn screening uh, for the research purposes. So that is a key part of this. Uh, and so what the amendment essentially states is that uh, when, whenever a newborn goes through newborn screening, uh, they receive what's known as a dry heel prick. Uh, that is what is used to test uh, for the diseases. Often. That dry blood spot is then used for research purposes. The dry blood spot is de-identified uh, and is used for quality assurance and quality improvement of these tests. It's to ensure that the machines and the tests are working. We want to make sure that the tests that say that they can screen for these disorders are doing what they say. And we need to constantly be checking 
to ensure that they are up to uh, up to snuff, essentially. Uh, in addition, some of these uh, dry blood spots do help with further research for other um, newborn screening diseases uh, that have yet to be added to the RUS. Uh, it helps to develop new screening methods as well as new treatments. Um, and so Senator Paul would like to require informed consent. The issue around that is informed consent can be difficult to obtain just from a logistical point of view. Uh, there have been studies out there that show that over 90% of parents would happily uh, provide their informed consent for this newborn screening research. Uh, but unfortunately, the hospitals are too strained or it takes too much money or too much time to ask for the informed consent, so they just never do it. Uh, and so we're hoping that there is a compromise out there. Uh, we're still speaking with members of the Senate uh, and trying to kind of push that point uh, of the impact this language, the negative impact this amendment will have. Uh, and so in terms of, next slide please, things that you guys can do, uh, call and email Senator Paul's office to let him know uh, the negative harms of this amendment, as well as Chairman Alexander's office uh, to let him know, again, the, the issues that are around with, with this amendment. Uh, and again, call any key senators, Senator McConnell, Schumer, and Murray are great. Uh, and also share with your advocates in both Kentucky and Tennessee. Kentucky, since it's the home of Senator Paul, and Tennessee, as is the home of Senator Alexander. Um, and that is, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to email me at dsimon at everylifefoundation.org. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Do you have a one-pager that we could yeah. send out? Uh, yes, there is a one-pager. Uh, if anybody needs one, please let me know. I'll send it to you. Yes. I've got Kentucky and Tennessee families that are... Great. Thank you, Dylan. Um, Pat Egan is on the phone and is going to share with us about the Lymphedema Treatment Act. Go ahead, Pat. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I hope you can hear me, yes? Okay. Yes, we can. Great. So I'm going to fast forward just a smidgen because you said that we had some good news. So the good news is that our bill was folded into H.R. 3, which passed the House in December. So that's the good news. Now, so what's our bill? So the Lymphedema Treatment Act is the number one co-sponsored health care bill before Congress. It, it provides um, a Medicare benefit to cover compression materials for the treatment of lymphedema. Um, that's really the only day in, day out treatment that we have. We have there is um, manual lymphedema massage, but anyway, in terms of treatment, we have to wear the mask. Um, there is no pharmaceutical treatment available as yet. Uh, so the the Lymphedema Treatment Act. Uh, tries to reduce the overall cost of lymphedema treatment by decreasing the incidence of associated complications when you don't use compression. Next slide, please. So lymphedema is an umbrella term. It's not a single disease. Secondary lymphedema is more common. It's generally associated with cancer treatment. That's the dominant form. But in the rare disease community, primary lymphedema is hereditary. It's the kind of lymphedema I have. It's the people, the red figures in this um, slide. Thank you. Next. So our progress in the 116th Congress was that the bill was introduced early on by Senator Cantwell and shortly thereafter by Representative Schakowsky. At this point, we have 70 co-sponsors in, in the Senate, of which 19 are members of the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus. That's 86% of the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus from the Senate. And 373 co-sponsors in the House, of which 124 are members of the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus. So these are very high numbers, and we thank the Rare Disease Congressional Caucus tremendously for their support. Next slide. So here's the chart that shows where we stand in terms of other healthcare bills. Uh, we've been number one 
uh, for a bit because we've been very, we've just worked tirelessly on securing co-sponsorship. I want to point out that number four on this list is the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, ELSA, which the RDLA has also been very active with. So I think RDLA is to be congratulated for its effectiveness. Next slide, please. So, our, as I said, our good news is that our bill passed the House uh, through HR3 in December. So, so that's the good news. But the news that we have to work on is that this HR3 might not be taken up anytime soon in the Senate. And there may be a compromise drug pricing bill that we hope will combine provisions from both chambers and that the Lymphedema Treatment Act will again be folded into whatever compromise bill um, evolves. So we're still working pretty hard. Next slide, please. So one thing that we would like to ask is if you plan to attend Rare Disease Week and you are inclined to include um, our one pager. We would so appreciate your doing so. And we have something on our website that's actually front and back. It explains that it's not a single disease and it includes sort of a facts, fact sheet summary of the bill. Um, so we thank you if that's something that you would do. Next slide, please. We would also like to invite you to join the Lymphedema Lobby Days on March 1st and 2nd. Um, everyone is welcome. And it, it's right after the Rare Disease Week. And if you're in the area, you might like to try, see what our Lobby Days is like, especially if you want to see how we go about um, meetings to secure the co-sponsorships, et cetera. So we invite you to join us. Next slide, please. So our message is that, um, you know, these bills can get through. We just have to keep forging ahead. And we, um, we thank everybody involved with our DLA for their tremendous support. It's been a great association and encourage you to um, get to the Capitol Hill in February for Rare Disease Week. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, it's very exciting to hear um, that you guys are seeing movement on your bill. Um, let's see. Sorry, you guys. I'm struggling with this uh, WebEx today. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill 2020 because it is coming up soon. Um, in case you don't already have it on your calendar, it's February 25th to February 28th. We're going to have rare disease patients, caregivers, um, scientists, physicians from all over the country coming to Washington, D.C. to learn more about rare disease policy and advocacy and how it affects them um, and the rare disease community. And we're going to have a series of events aimed at empowering our patients and caregivers. And as always, these events are free for um, the um, rare disease community. Um, so I thought I would just briefly tell you guys about the events um, and then encourage you all to register if you haven't already. Um, new to the week's events from um, past conversations is the FDA has sent out a save the date for a rare disease day public meeting at the FDA on that Monday. Um, it was um, shared by their patient office as well as on their uh, social media channels. So it's uh, official in that regard. But um, we don't have a time yet, but it will take place at FDA in Silver Spring. So if you plan to be here on Monday, um, please keep an eye out for communications when that becomes finalized. And We'll update the information on our website as soon as that does become finalized. You can find it there. Um, and then um, Tuesday is when um, Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill officially begins. 
with a rare disease congressional caucus briefing um, on Capitol Hill um, that afternoon from 1 to 2 p.m. And then the documentary screening and cocktail reception will begin at 5.30 that evening at the Ronald Reagan Building. On Wednesday, we will get started bright and early um, at 8 o'clock for the legislative conference, and that will be an all-day event till 4.45 um, at the Ronald Reagan Building again. And then for our young adults, we're hosting a meetup similar to what we did last year here at the Rare Hub uh, following the legislative conference PM, so that our young adults in the rare disease community can meet, socialize, um, they can strategize about their their meetings the next day, they can talk about what they learned at the legislative conference. Um, we had about 30 young adults join us for that meetup last year, so it'll be great to have even more this year. Um, and it's so wonderful to see our young adults get more and more involved in advocacy. The next day, again, we're going to start bright and early with the Hill Day breakfast, again at the Ronald Reagan Building, and we'll have a keynote speaker. Um, you'll be able to check in on your schedules, if there's any changes or adjustments that have been made, um, so it's a good thing to go to. And then you can go straight from there to your meetings on the Hill. Uh, RDLA schedules those meetings for all of our advocates, so when you register, uh, you'll be asked how many meetings you would like, whether you want your three meetings with your representative and two senators, or whether you would like more <laughs> meetings, um, and you'll have the choice of saying four to five meetings or um, six or more. So depending on how much you want to walk that day, um, you can make the choice that's right for you, and we'll do our best to, um, to accommodate those preferences um, for our advocates for their Hill meetings. Um, so please, um, you will receive those schedules at the legislative conference. Um, so um, just hold on tight, and you'll learn more about that in the app that we're going to use uh, in, on our webinar in February. And then that evening after you walked all day on the Hill, you can join us for the Rare Artist Reception at 5 o'clock. Um, and it's taking place in the Hart Senate Office Building, and we're going to have our Rare Artist Awardees, which were just announced yesterday. Um, here in D.C. for that reception to honor them and their artwork, and we'll be joined um, by members of Congress as well. And then the next day, Friday, uh, is Rare Disease Day at NIH, and that's an NIH event that many organizations are present at and that we um, help promote and encourage advocates to attend. Uh, so if you are interested in attending that particular event, uh, there is a link on our Rare Disease Week website that takes you to the NIH registration page. So make sure to register separately for that event. Um, the many reasons why you should attend uh, Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill, learn about um, the key legislative initiatives that have the potential to benefit rare disease patients, You'll have an opportunity to educate your legislators um, and share your story. Also raise awareness on your specific rare disease. And really, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for rare disease patients and caregivers to not only meet other people in their rare disease space, but across the rare disease community. Um, it's a great place to, to network and learn from each other. And um, I know a lot of advocates feel a lot of support from one another, so it's a great place to, um, to do that. The registration is open. You can find our registration link at rareadvocates.org slash rdw, and the registration will officially close on February 20th. If you want home meetings to be scheduled for you, it's very important for you to register before this deadline, otherwise we won't be able to schedule meetings for you with your members of Congress, so, um, so please register. And then as many of you know, the Every Life Foundation provides travel stipends for advocates to attend Rare Disease Week through our Rare Giving program to help offset the cost of travel to D.C. We know that it is not an inexpensive place to travel to, 
Um, applicants were, for the travel stipends were notified on December 18th as to whether or not they were receiving a travel stipend or placed on the wait list. If you did not receive an email, please email me as soon as possible so that I can let you know if you um, had received one or were waitlisted. We have reached out to folks that were awarded the travel stipends and we haven't heard back from through email. So um, check your email too. And um, our wonderful intern Emily is making phone calls today because tomorrow is the deadline for our travel stipend awardees to register to confirm that they are coming to Rare Disease Week and accepting their stipend. Um, so if you received a travel stipend and haven't registered, please register by tomorrow. Otherwise, you may be forfeiting your travel stipend so that we can give it to someone else on the wait list. Um, some important dates, um, we are actually going to do two webinars in February around Rare Disease Week. The first one on February 13th is going to be our in-depth webinars where we go into really the nitty-gritty on each event, um, the agenda for the legislative conference, as well as those legislative asks that we'll be having at Rare Disease Week. And then on February 20th, the week before, for Disease Week, we're going to do, for the first time, a first-time attendees orientation webinar. So it will be um, for our first-timers who have never attended Rare Disease Week, um, just to go over some of the details and make it an open space where they can ask questions and feel more comfortable before they get in their car or get on an airplane um, and come to D.C. And then, of course, the registration closes on February 20th as well. So. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, um, Espon Feldin at everylifefoundation.org. Um, so next month, because we're going to be doing our Rare Disease Week webinars and a week long of Rare Disease Week, we will be having our regular monthly RDLA meeting webinar. Um, so our next one will be March 19th at noon, so you can save the date on your calendar. Again, um, if you have any topics that you want to speak on or just want to learn more about, um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and we're happy to, to add it to our agenda at the next meeting or in the future. Uh, uh, someone on the, um, the WebEx asks, is the photo on Tuesday at the same place as the briefing? That's a good question. So actually, after the briefing um, on the Hill during Rare Disease Week, we will um, go outside in front of the Capitol building um, and take a picture as close to the steps on the northeast side of the Capitol building. Um, it'll be the closest point to the Capitol from the Senate side where the caucus briefing will be. So we'll just all get up and go at the same time all together. I don't see any other questions. So if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of our other speakers. Oh, we have one in the room. <laughs> Don't forget about us. <laughs> um, just curious, the FDA day and the NIH day, can you describe what happens on those days? Is it interaction or is it them presenting to it's, these? Yeah, so they'll have speakers and panels. And then I know at NIH they have um, different organizations have booths and so, um, but I'm not quite sure um, at FDA exactly what it'll look like, but I believe it's going to be panels with speakers. Will that be on about how many hours? Well, the FDA meeting is based, the NIH meeting is basically all day, yes. um, so I I don't know if it's similar <coughs> or not. With, with past FDA meetings, it's about six hours, I would say. And, and you know, they, I guess. Yeah, it might be about, about 10. Yeah, about, it may be between 9.30, 10 to 4 or something. Yeah. I mean, I'm just guessing. Yeah, that just, sounds just, about right. Just based on what I've been But hopefully we'll have more information to share on that. And then what do you do with a resident of the district? So um, a question in the room about I mean, um, what we well, do with uh, folks from D.C. who come to Rare Disease Week. Yeah, I mean, I know what they do with my other diseases, my diseases that I have, but what do you do with us? 
So our um, advocates who come from representation. Yeah, I'm I'm from DC too. So power. Um, but uh, our DC folks who participate in the Hill Day, they will come and they will meet with their delegate, um, Eleanor Holmes Norton, and then they will get paired off with other state groups so that they get to meet senators and representatives from other states so as I well. I go back to my other state. Yeah, you'll get assigned meeting. I mean, no, but I mean, I moved here from Florida. So oh. I, have, I know all those people. Yep, so if you have a special circumstance, you can um, certainly email me and we'll Thank take you. that into consideration. Yep. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to give you 13 extra minutes in your day. <laughs> Thank you all.